Address Food and Drug Agency has approved the emergency use of the Oxford AstraZeneca coronavirus vaccine. The agency says its safety committee has evaluated the vaccine's safety and efficacy for Nigerians. Uh, our ice correspondent Nisi Gabriel reports. Good news for Nigeria as the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID vaccine has been approved for emergency use in the country. Nigeria's Food and Drug Agency says four vaccine candidates are being reviewed. It is from Serum Institute of India that we got our dossier uh, on February 10, 2021, which was last week. The NAVDAC vaccine committee commenced the expedited review immediately and the members of the committee have worked assiduously to ensure that the review was done as planned. The recommendation for emergency use authorization of COVID-19 vaccine from AstraZeneca or through Serum Institute, it is also called COVID Shield, uh, was based on rigorous scientific considerations. There are concerns about how well the AstraZeneca vaccine would work in Nigeria after South Africa halted its rollout. Studies show the jab isn't as effective against the virus dominance in South Africa. Nigeria has three labs that do sequencing to know which variants we have in Nigeria, which ones we don't have. And from the results from the labs, uh, it showed that we don't have the South Africa variant, at least as of last week. But the study that has been done to know the impact of the variant from UK on the vaccine effectiveness showed that it did not affect the effectiveness of uh, AstraZeneca vaccine. The AstraZeneca vaccine can be stored at normal fridge temperatures, making it easier to distribute in Nigeria than others available. Experts hope the rollout can bring the pandemic under control in Nigeria, reducing cases and saving lives. Nisi Gabriel, Arise News. All right, thank you for that report, there, Nisi Gabriel. Soon I'll come to you this morning. Yeah, so approved for emergency. The vaccines are coming in. Probably we'll get a shot soon. Fingers crossed. And Fingers thanks crossed. to NAFDAQ as well, while we're giving thanks to <laughs> Professor Adeye and her team. Yeah. Great job. And it's good to note that in Nigeria, we do not have the SA variant yeah. yet, touch wood. So we don't need to have those fears. You know, there are a lot of fears that the AstraZeneca vaccine is not effective against that particular variant. But that's not our problem at this time. And we also need to thank AstraZeneca for entering into the licensing agreement with Serum Institute of India that made this possible. Serum mm. Institute then promised one billion doses mm -hmm. for middle and low income countries. So this is really great because there's been a lot of vaccine nationalism as we've been complaining about mm -hmm. and the richer countries of the world hoarding it in quite the most shameful manner. So mm -hmm. this is wonderful news. And great news, Dr. Bati. Well, first, uh, I think it's uh, important to uh, express the opinion that it's good that now the Nigerian authorities are coming forward with more information, they are more forthcoming about what they are doing. And I say that against the background of you know, what Chikwe uh, Yeko, as you said, when we interviewed him on this, on this program, about what the rollout plan is, what the national vaccination program uh, is like. And he said, well, when you are building a house, you bring cement, you bring sand, it's when the house begins to show up that you begin to see the details of what the structure looks like. So we're beginning to see the details. Before uh, Professor Mujisola Adeyeye of NAVDA spoke up, we had the uh, Minister of Health, uh, Osage Aniri, uh, and also the Minister of Foreign Affairs, telling us that Nigeria was already talking to a number of countries, including China, including India, and that they were trying to put certain things in place. But on those occasions, we had asked that we needed more details. Now, what we can see now is that those details are beginning to come forward. Now we know that Nigeria is voting for the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. But was this really based on clinical trials or on expediency? I ask this question because you recall that originally what we were told was Nigeria was going to get about 40 million doses of the uh, Pfizer vaccine under the uh, COVAX uh, facility. But that COVAX facility eventually we were told where Nigeria will not get uh, the Pfizer vaccine. 
Nigeria will get the AstraZeneca vaccine. So is this a question of Nigeria just following the uh, trend and say, oh, AstraZeneca vaccine is good for us? However, the AstraZeneca vaccine has been approved by the WHO. And the WHO, against the protestations uh, from South Africa about whether the variant can address the variant, uh, the mutation in South Africa or not, had said, look, it's better you take it. Uh, because according to the WHO, the advantages outweigh the risks. So that's one question to worry about in that regard. Now, South Africa has also donated the 1 million doses plus 500,000 that is expected this week or next week uh, of AstraZeneca vaccines, donated it to the AVATT, which is the African Union uh, uh, Volunteer Action uh, for the Tracking of uh, the COVID-19. So is this, that's why I also again raise the question about expediency. But if it is true that NAVDAC and uh, the National Agency for Primary Healthcare Development uh, uh, you know, Agency of Nigeria, MPHCDA, if indeed all of this is based on data and science, I think it's a very good development. I think in that regard, it will be a very positive development. But the question that uh, Professor Adeyeye and our team we still need to answer is that we have been told at the University of Edinburgh, the University of, uh, of Reading, and also by the Canadian authorities, that there is now a Nigerian variant. The South Africans abandoned the AstraZeneca vaccine because they said it didn't quite fit into their own plan. Does it fit into our own plan? Have they looked at the Nigerian variant that has been uh, reported? However, the AstraZeneca vaccine is cheap. It can be easily stored. 2%, uh, eight, eight, eight degrees uh, refrigerating level. And, uh, you know, so that's what recommends it. And then the WHO recommendation. Right. But it's good that we are making progress and they are giving us more information. We need more information. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Bati. We, that, that's all we can take. We'll take a short break now. We'll return. The team will come back and, and we'll give all the insights. Over. Right. All right, welcome back to the morning show right here on the Rise News Channel. Uh, we go to Rotus this morning. Rotus, um, some good news uh, that there's been a growth, economic growth, so we're out of recession, isn't it? Good morning. Yes, yes, there is. Good morning, Rafai. Good morning, Tundu, and uh, good Hi. morning, Doctor. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, good news, but we have, to, we have to temper that good news uh, a little bit. Uh, the economy grew by 0.11%, 0.11% in the fourth quarter of uh, 2020, the last three months of last year. And uh, as far as full year GDP is concerned, we contracted by 1.92%. But positive growth in the fourth quarter uh, was enough uh, to officially, uh, you know, to officially state that Nigeria has exited the uh, uh, recession, which I, you know, I was surprised by that because I, I, I thought where it was going to be a contraction in the fourth quarter. But if we, if we take a look at, uh, if I just take a look at quarterly growth, if you look at how far the nation uh, has come, uh, if you look at the fourth quarter, so of course, Q1, 1.87%. Of course, we fell. Uh, the recession hit us in Q3 when we contracted by 3.62%. Q2, uh, contraction of 6.1%. And then the fourth quarter of 0.11%. Uh, now, as far as the, the drivers, Let's take a look at the oil versus uh, non-oil sector. So this is really the story for those asking, how did we get out of a recession? It was driven by the non-oil sector. So if you look at the non-oil growth rates, that is the blue, the blue line. Uh, in Q4, we grew by 1.69%. The non-oil sector grew by 1.69%. For full year, that's 1.69% in the fourth quarter. For full year, it contracted by 1.25. As far as the oil sector, it's just still kind of ugly. You can see the red line plunging below, uh, plunging below uh, the, the, the border line there. Non -oil, the oil sector in the fourth quarter contracted by 19.7%. For a full year, contracted by 8.89. If you look at oil production, look at what's circled at the far right. Uh, this is the lowest, this has to be the lowest level of oil production Nigeria has had in about 
uh, 15, 20 years. I remember when we were looking at Q3 GDP, uh, I was talking about how uh, that's the, the bar that's right before Q4. It was 1.67%. You have to go all the way back to Q3 of 2016 when we were in our last recession. To, um, to, that was our previous low of 1.6. And we've been averaging about 2 million barrels per day. OPEC is meeting in April. I know Saudi Arabia is saying that they're they possibly wanting to um, increase, you know, move away from the oil cuts, which have been supported oil prices because they're encouraged by what's been going on uh, with crude oil prices. I know Nigeria definitely wants to, um, you know, increase oil production. So that's one of the key things to look at when we talk about um, oil production. So as far as, so we know the story is non-oil. It was the non-oil sector that managed to get us out of recession. Let's look at some of the sectors. This is, I could spend the rest of the more, entire three-hour morning show talking about telecoms. Look at that. Top right, 17.64% for telecommunications and information services. This is healthy double digit growth that we are looking for. This was for the fourth quarter. For full year, let's take a look at full year. In telecommunications, informations, uh, telecommunications and information services, 15.9%. You, you want to see this. Look at the line growing from left all the way uh, to right. This is what the federal government, in my estimation, should be looking at and saying, how do we capitalize uh, on this? Quickly look at uh, subscribers from the NCC, the Communications Commission. Look at the growth in subscribers. We are at 204 million as of December 2020. Teledensity is at 107%. So teledensity is looking at the, every 100 connections in this particular space. It's probably skewed towards the urban centers versus rural, but still, the financial inclusion has to be driven through uh, the telcos. When you talk about mobile money, if you look at what's happening in South Africa, in Kenya, mobile money is financial freedom. They're actually, um, you know, giving virtual cards now. I know one of the telcos is taking on Safaricom in Kenya, where they are offering virtual cards, bypassing banks, and allowing people to use their phones as their banks, essentially. If Nigeria wants to get to her financial inclusion target of 94, 95 percent by 2023. I know the central bank has already given the payment, uh, payment PSB licenses, payment serving bank licenses, but mobile money has to be allowed to thrive in this country because you give people financial freedom, you give them economic freedom, you give them the growth that they are looking for. Very quickly, agriculture was another reason. Uh, the central government MFLA has to be smiling because this is, has to be the best quarterly growth that we've seen um, in agriculture, 3.42% since the advent of the Anchor Boras program and all the other heavy, heavy um, uh, investments that has been made in agriculture. So 3.42% for agriculture. Another reason why we saw non-oil growth take Nigeria out of recession in the fourth quarter. Full year, if we take a look at agricultural full year, well, you know, 2.17% manageable, but there's still improvement. I think other areas, um, the food and beverage sector of manufacturing, and I think construction, but only a handful of sectors that performed well. We still, as far as manufacturing overall, Air services, transportation, trade, those were still, those still contracted. But the key thing is, though, how does the, the ordinary man on the streets feel this? You know, how, is, are there jobs all of a sudden popping up everywhere? Is Gary and Rice, are the prices for Gary and Rice lower? Um, uh, is there more access to electricity? If you ask the ordinary man on the streets whether they feel whether Nigeria has come out of recession, they'll probably tell you no. So mm. this is still, it's encouraging. We are out of recession. But we've got to piggyback on this, and I think that it is through telecoms and ICT. That is where I the mean, focus has to be I mean, to, for us to grow further. Great point you made about uh, telecoms, Rotos, and, and the fact that mobile money has to crack it. We need to take money out of the space of just cash. Sustainable ca cash is no longer sustainable. It will never be sustainable. Paper money fiat will never be sustainable. It's gone digital. We need to look for digital expressions for money. Mobile money is another one. It's going to change a great deal. The reason why Kenya has been able to grow economically is because of this. See what Safaricom did with M-Pesa. Mm -hmm. There's a big joke going around in Kenya that you will pay a police officer a bribe in Kenya with M-Pesa. Ah, okay. And that's it. Right. And that's a mobile money option that we should look in. Right. In fact, to crack the problem of rural electricity, the same company that did M-Pesa came up with another company <coughs> called M-Copa, where you use solar panels to generate electricity but you use mobile telecoms communication recharge card payment mm. to pay for the, the solar power, panel. Right. So look at companies like M-Pesa, mobile money. Look at companies like M-Copper. Right. These are things that are going to increase that accelerated growth we want to the rural belt 
in this country and start to take us into a place of real growth across board. So these are the ideas we should be looking at. But kudos, you know, it's shown that the telecom sector is strong. And that's why when they said they said well, that's why when they said they were going to block some lines because of non nin registration, right, yeah. just imagine the damage you'll have done to the telecom. It, well, it's just there for you. I think the issue I think the issue is as follows. One, this is the first positive growth that we have recorded in the last three quarters. Right? right. And the fact that uh, that growth is coming from the non oil sector. Uh, is something that we can celebrate. Uh, what it means, yes, oil uh, contributes about 10% uh, to GDP, but, you know, it's uh, It's actually 5% in quarter four. It was even strong. <coughs> oil yeah. only five. Non-oil was 94.5 or so, so it yeah, even shrunk. Yeah, but it's more responsible for, <clears throat> it accounts more for revenue right. and also right. for foreign exchange earnings. And in the same quarter that we saw oil, you know, the crude oil are uh, dropping in terms of contribution to uh, uh, GDP by over 9%. We saw the non oil sector, agriculture and telecom growing. Yes. So that shows that there is very great potential in the uh, non oil sector. Indeed. Now, but when we look at it and we're told 0.11% uh, in the fourth quarter of 2020, I think it, it came as a shock, or rather, let me say, it's shocking. Uh, because the projection yeah. was that we were looking towards the second quarter of uh, uh, 2020. But the question is, what, what are the implications with regard to high food inflation, high headline inflation, and also the MPC? Would the MPC rely on this, the Monetary Policy Committee or the CBA, to increase interest rates? So those are projections. And then what will be the final outcome of this second wave of coronavirus that we're seeing and the corresponding impact on the first quarter of 2021 on GDP growth? Well, unfortunately, I don't have time to make my comment, Rotus. We have to let you go. Uh, so Thank you, Rotus. Uh, thank you so much, Rotus. Really appreciate you for your time. All right, we'll move on to our business update, global business update, I should say, with Michael Wilson. Why we come back from this quick comment. All right, moving on to global business update. Uh, Michael Wilson joins us now from London. Michael, good morning. Great to have you. Good morning. Uh, yeah, so the momentum uh, of the week is actually slipping down now uh, as more worries uh, are coming out. US jobless claims didn't help uh, yesterday either. Uh, so we're going into a sort of uh, down pattern as far as the weekend's concerned. And the malaise from the United States markets has really extended into Asia overnight, or rather yesterday, the S&P lost about half a percent, the Nasdaq about three quarters of a percent, and the Dow, Dow Jones Industrials down about half a percent. And uh, futures um, are actually, US futures at least, uh, are down as well. So as far as Asia was concerned, uh, they're all tracking, or have been tracking lower today. Nikkei about one and a quarter down, uh, the uh, Shanghai Composite down over half a percent. Um, the bullish center sentiment has sort of um, coincided with the end of the week, as I alluded to right at the beginning of this. Um, it probably means that Asian investors in particular, and this may well spill over into European markets and American markets as well, don't want to be left with money on the table if there are any disturbing headlines over the weekend. Not to say there will be, but who knows? We are in the news business after all. Um, China's crackdown on Jack Ma and Ant Financial has had a, uh, an interesting effect. This is what this is. Don't do things unless you really have worked out what's going to happen. And sure enough, what's happened is people still want to borrow money. They're not borrowing it from Ant Financial because it's had its um, activities curtailed by the Chinese authorities. So what are they doing? They're going to other lenders. What are other lenders charging? Higher interest rates. What is the result of that? Possibly more defaults. That's what's happening there. So overall, then, a mixed week on the downside. Um, both in uh, Asia, Europe and the United States. Um, not, not, not a great deal happening. I'll just recap those US weekly jobless figures for you. They came in at 86,000, say 861,000 rather. That's a four week high. Now, part of that might be explained by companies shuttering their car factories because of the semiconductor uh, shortage and so on. But um, again, it, it's, not, it's not the kind of figure that the markets were looking for. With that in mind, um, our senior, or rather the United States senior uh, Treasury official, Treasury Secretary, 
Lady Janet Yellen has been pushing for more stimulus in the United States. She said that the one point nine trillion uh, proposal should help the US get back to um, full employment next year. Listen to what she says, though. This is, is really, really instructive. She says, we think it's very important to have a big package because we need to address the pain that the pandemic has caused. That 15 million Americans behind in their rent, 24 million adults, and listen to this, 12 million children who don't have enough to eat. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the richest economy in the world in the 21st century. Robin Hood says sorry to the sheriff. So he did, yes. Uh, Vlad Tenef, the chief executive of Robin Hood, uh, apologised for the company's role in that game shop, GameStop shenanigans. Um, the target, he was definitely the target of the lawmakers. Um, our favourite chair, Maxine Waters, got extremely tetchy and banged down her gavel after old Vlad had only been going for a, about 30 seconds and said, you must apologise. And he did apologise, finally, apologising to customers, saying that uh, the game stop trading frenzy um, wasn't about to happen again. We did everything. We're doing everything that we can to make sure this doesn't happen again, says Vlad. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> the lawmakers... The, the, the lawmakers expected that. I would suggest what the lawmakers do is use the weekend to watch two movies, The Wolf of Wall Street and also The Big Short. Then they'd get some idea of how the markets actually work mm -hmm. and some idea of what fear and greed actually does. That would be my recommendation. Oh, and Bitcoin will be next. How about that? Let's have a congressional hearing about Bitcoin. Your UK consumer confidence here then, it's improving because vaccine, the rapid vaccine rollout's happening. We're assuming that people under the age of 40 now may be coming up for some kind of vaccination fairly soon. Sterling, therefore, three-year high. Uh, that, sh that sent, as you would imagine, shares tumbling because with many companies exporting higher sterling means fewer exports. It doesn't actually work out like that, but it's a classic trigger for equities to slide. Um, oil, now we talked about this yesterday. I, I have been wrong about this. I admit it. It looks like an overdue correction is beginning as far as oil is concerned. It's been oversold. The Texas big chill story has not actually been a critical factor. I don't know so much about that. We'll see. But maybe, maybe more next week. Bit of a sell off as far as Asia is concerned. Um, failure of the $60 barrel mark. And that didn't actually last for very long. Gold is poised for collapse. US dollar goes up, gold goes down. Uh, US yields go up, gold goes down again. So that's same pattern has been playing out now. 1765 announced this morning. So ladies and gentlemen, your gold bars are worth less than they were. However, help is on the horizon. Finally, finally, before we hit the weekend, have a think about this. Copper is up. Dr. Copper has risen in to save the day. The red metal's been trending higher on hopes that the red metal may well get higher itself and the global economy will recover. Dr. Copper is so called because he tends to be quite a reliable, or he or she tends to be quite a reliable indicator of what's going on since most developed economies need to use copper. They don't have much room for gold and oil. Well, oil's oil. So therefore, an optimistic note to a week that's tending to trend on the downside. That's your global view. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. I have one more movie to add to that list. Wall Street. Michael Money Douglas. Yeah. yeah. The original two, Gordon Gecko. Yeah, Gordon <laughs> Gecko. That's true. Two, two, Oliver Stone's two, movie. Two, too old fashioned and too traditional. All that's about is getting insider trading on his dad's airline company. No, I'll stick with my two. Thank you very much. Well, no, well, I, but I did add, I'm not adding, I'm not adding to yours. That's for me, the quintessential <laughs> movie about greed is good. But yeah. I hadn't actually made my point. The GameStop hearings, what did you think of the point raised by Representative um, Rashida Tlaib that Wall Street should be charged 0.1% and that would raise $800 billion in 10 years? Yeah, I've I've heard I've heard loads of that. Everybody likes to have a go at the financial markets and, and God bless them they can. And if they want to try to get that through Congress, then absolutely fine. No, I think I think it's a great idea. I don't hold up one tiny hope that that will happen because that's not the way the world works. But I think it's in, 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 a, in a sense, it's a good idea. I think far more importantly is the lawmakers should attempt to understand, as I was saying, what actually did happen. It is about greed. You're absolutely right. And that is not going to go away. Well, very quickly, uh, Michael, I think it's interesting political theater around uh, uh, Robin Hood and uh, GameStop. But the big issue is that the industry itself may perhaps uh, need to uh, adapt and reinvent itself. 
But the, the uh, question I would like to ask you is about Australia, which we talked about yesterday, and Facebook. We understand that the Australian authorities are now talking to Facebook and uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, what is likely to happen at the end of the day? Who is going to blink first? Uh, would uh, Mark Zuckerberg and uh, Facebook uh, roll back by this time uh, next week? And then secondly, who are we, uh, the Chinese company, uh, with the uh, fall in the sales of uh, telecom uh, facilities, is now going into pig farming. How about that for innovation? They're talking about pig farming, applying uh, artificial intelligence to support uh, pigry, yeah. and they are talking about coal mining. Uh, what kind of uh, innovation is that from uh, telecom to pigry? Well, we, we, will, we will both be long in the ground by the time those big conglomerates that are starting again uh, are actually dissolved. Conglomeration is nothing new. Huawei's quite white right to get into the pig market. It was wiped out. Pork's very important to the Chinese. It was wiped out, as you know, because of a, a African flu um, a, a, a few years ago. So if, if Huawei's getting into that, I think it echoes what we were talking about yesterday as far as uh, the UAE is concerned. They want to have price caps on food. And why are they doing that? Because what they're going to do is that they are very, very keen to diversify, diversify away from a failing industry, which is the oil industry. Why not? What are they getting into? What have they got? They've got sunshine. So they're getting into agriculture. Very good indeed. Great for Huawei. As far as Facebook and Australia is concerned, I'm just wondering how many Australians you actually know. Because if you do, the thing that Australians don't do is blink. What they will say to Facebook is, you follow the example of every of, of Google, for example, which has gone into business partnership with the distribution. That's all you do. It's nothing huge. Media companies have been doing it for years. They buy distributors to get their product out to further people, but they pay. They get paid for that product. That's what this issue is about. Should news that that Facebook uses on its website get paid for? Yes, I, I think it should, because I'm like you're in the news business. Um, what Facebook is saying is, however, yeah, but we give you a much bigger audience. Well, yeah, fine. OK, I'd like to get paid for my product. So Australians do not blink. Uh, Michael, Australians do not blink. It's easier to say. But Facebook has the largest repository of database in the world. It's got over 2 billion you know, stock of data. They've got rack centers everywhere that are mammoth. They've got data. Data is the new oil. Australia needs that data. You saw what they did to various departments of government in Australia? That was just a little showing that I have data. I have what it takes. We might see an amendment. In your face. <laughs> the Australian That's, cabinet, they might. They in might your see face. An That's, what's your reaction to that? Because it's so easy to say Australians don't blink. They yeah. Just might. They don't blink. <laughs> garai, garai. But Facebook has got data. Don't ignore that. Yeah. So. No, I'm not ignoring it at all. What I, I think, I think the point is that social media has not even moved into stage one of where it's actually going in the world. In other words, Voila. what regulators are going to do, and 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 it may it may well get broken up. I think that's what you should be thinking about. Facebook may be waving a big stick at the moment, but it won't last. Well, by way of information, Facebook uh, is considering uh, waving or removing the hashtag delete on government and. <laughs> government service messages on its platforms. Yeah. So that's some kind of compromise. And this weekend, we understand that there will be meetings to see whether more compromise will be uh, achieved. My, Michael, by, by any stretch of your imagination, I want to talk about another Australian. His name is Rupert Murdoch. But, but do you by any chance knew, know, know the content of the deal he made with Google? Still on Australia? <laughs> I, d I don't know the, de the there is there is, I haven't seen any detail, but the general thing is that what they're doing is that they're sharing uh, they're, they're going to share ad revenue. In other words, what they're doing is they Murdoch is very or rather News Corp now <coughs> is is very. Um, it, it knows very well that its print advertising has fallen. That was the reason for the fall in its quarterly figures yesterday. So it's very, very, it, it knows what it needs to do. These companies need to work together. They need reach. Google needs content. Um, th this, this, to, so if they're sharing, I understand what they're going to do is to share ad revenues to start with. I suspect a lot of that's got to be knocked out right now, but still, it, this, this is the contest that it's all about media, whether it be social media, our kind of media, 
transmitted media, broadcast, printed media. It's all about putting a value on the content. Once you have that, once you have, once you have a, 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 a handle on that, and you tie into that what the distribution complications are, or indeed uh, ramifications are, or even uh, how distribution makes that, that content go to more people, um, then you have uh, a business deal. I'm not, con I'm not confident or uh, experienced enough to be able to talk very, very strongly about the business side of the media, but they, Google and News Corp are doing a deal. And believe me, if they do a deal, it'll be in the interests of both. Well, Michael, just before we go, there's a story I read, uh, you know, um, talking about IMF endorsing the decision of the Nigerian government, and that probably explains my interest in this story, uh, to ban financial institutions from allowing trade in cryptocurrencies. Now, what is the business of the IMF with uh, cryptocurrencies? How important is that uh, declaration by IMF? Uh, there is a problem with uh, cryptocurrencies. I know your position, you think, you know, cryptocurrency is, uh, you know, just a wave of the moment, uh, speculative mania and all of that. But why should it be important to the IMF? I, I think, well, the, 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 I'm not quite sure. I mean, the IMF basically is a bureaucracy which tends to look at the world through a rearview mirror. We understand that. Um, that has clearly come to their attention that something's going on with cryptocurrencies in the same way that it came to our attention to, to cover the congressional hearing uh, y yesterday amongst US lawmakers and Robin Hood and, and all the rest of them. It, it, it's not a big part of what's going on. And I, I am... I am sceptical. I'm not critic. I'm sceptical about cryptocurrencies, as you know, because they aren't in the mainstream yet. As soon as they're in the mainstream okay. and they start, and they start okay, to hit the, the kind okay. of regulatory thing. Okay, Michael. I mean, we'd like to say a very big thank you on your comments on the IMF. And like Julius Inrere calls it, International Minister of Finance. Uh, but we'll go to a big break. We'll come back. We'll talk some more. All right, welcome back. Uh, updates on COVID-19 pandemic. Adesu Omorua, uh, great to have you. I'm sure there's a great sense of triumphalism. We've uh, given emergency use to AstraZeneca. Indeed. <laughs> good morning, Rufai. Good, good morning, Dr. Basi, and good morning, Sundrum. Good morning. Well, first, before we go into the AstraZeneca approval for Nigeria, let's take a look at the global figures and what uh, the pandemic is saying around the world. We have now surpassed the 110 million mark uh, for cases of COVID-19 and 2.4 million deaths. In Africa as well, we have surpassed the green milestone of 100,000 deaths. Here in Nigeria, 877 new COVID-19 infections were recorded in 26 states in the last 24 hours here in Nigeria. Uh, well, according to the latest data, the most infections were from Lagos State, with 273 confirmed cases. Yesterday, AstraZeneca News, uh, um, Rufai, you had discussed it earlier on the news segment of the show. It goes to show that Nigeria is a step closer to having uh, a vaccine campaign, a national campaign against COVID-19. Uh, just to reiterate, because I know you people had discussed this earlier, for those who are skeptical and still wonder why Nigeria is opting for this vaccine, while South Africa ditched it for the one jab Johnson & Johnson, just to reiterate again, like health authorities have said in Nigeria, like, like the NAVDAC boss also said yesterday, and I think Dr. Abati mentioned this in passing, the source of concern, which is the dominant variant in South Africa, has not uh, been recorded in Nigeria. And the WHO, uh, additionally, the WHO has said there is no cause for alarm. Even if you have this variant, you can still go ahead and use the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine because there is some level of efficacy. The study in South Africa was a small study with just about 2,000 people who were young people. The average age was 31, so we do not know much about um, that vaccine and how it affects uh, mild to moderate infections, which at the moment we don't see in Nigeria. Most of our cases are, um, you know, very mild, asymptomatic people who get, you know, who recover from the infection uh, very rapidly with, uh, with uh, of course, medication. But moving away from that, uh, as G7 leaders face accusation 
of collectively pre-ordering over 1.5 billion vaccines for their population. Uh, that's more than their population required, by the way. Uh, French President Emmanuel Macron is urging the EU and the US to give up 5% of their current COVID-19 vaccine supplies to developing countries in Africa. This is coming ahead of the meeting of the G7 to be hosted by Britain under the chairmanship of Boris Johnson. Now, while the wealthy West stirs up a vast surplus, the French proposal comes when Russia and China are already providing their vaccines directly to low and middle income countries. Uh, President Macron is also calling for transparency in pricing regime. He said some countries were being charged two to three times the price paid by the EU. Uh, hopefully, this doesn't become another vaccine diplomacy or power tussle in the making. It's a global public health challenge, and no one is safe until everyone is safe. So hopefully, we don't see that tussle between the West, China, and Russia when it comes to these vaccine supplies again. Uh, finally, the Vatican is taking Pope Francis' pro-vaccine stance very seriously. Uh, the Vatican says employee who refused to get coronavirus shots without a valid medical reason risk being fired. A February 8 decree signed by the governor of the Vatican City, uh, Cardinal Giuseppe Betalo, says that employees who opt out of vaccination without a proven medical reason could be subject to sanction up to and including the interruption of the relationship of employment. Uh, however, this has been criticized by many Italians who took to Twitter and said it was contrary to Pope Francis' general call for mercy. It also comes at a time when officials in Italy, Austria, and Bulgaria are starting to see public resistance to the British vaccine Oxford AstraZeneca, which is currently being rolled out in those countries. Well, I do so. First, let us commend uh, the uh, president of France, Emmanuel Macron, for joining the debate that has been out there. Three major points that he made. One, the point you made about the need to address the challenge of vaccine inequity, whereby some countries have more than they need. And specifically, the United Kingdom and Canada have, in fact, uh, double the needs of their citizens. He also made a point about intellectual property and how that has become a challenge in terms of ensuring vaccine equity. Then he made a point again uh, about the fact that, look, if you have this vaccine inequity, you will have what he calls, and I quote him directly, war of influence over vaccines, and that this will not be uh, productive or useful to the rest of the world. But he's not the originator of the debate. I think two days ago, Antonio Guterres, the UN uh, Secretary General, also raised the same point when he said it would be widely unfair uh, for the rest of the world, for the rich world, uh, to, uh, you know, overlook uh, the poor developing countries of the world in terms of access to vaccines. But in my view, uh, it was uh, uh, Dr. Ngozi okonjo Iweala that made the point when she was announced as the next WTO uh, Director General. She summarized it by saying that nobody is safe until everyone is safe. That was exactly what she said. And she said she was going to make, uh, you know, uh, uh, vaccine equity uh, one of her major issues. And that, this is the point, uh, basically. And that point had been made also by the WHO yes. in January, when the WHO uh, issued a release uh, against uh, vaccine nationalism, calling on manufacturers, uh, countries, political leaders, stakeholders, health workers, to make sure that in this fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that the whole world embraces the idea of global solidarity. So uh, this is just another voice uh, joining it. And the point, again, as made by Dr. Ngozi okonjo weala that the entire world faces the risk of losing up to about $9 trillion in terms of output if we do not all come together. Because if the developed uh, countries if they go and stockpile all the uh, vaccines, and then the rest of us in uh, the developing countries where we don't have uh, serious leaders suffer, where we will manage to buy a ticket and we will carry that uh, virus, <laughs> we will take it to them. But of course, I guess there are lessons that developing countries can learn from this. Many developing countries who are relying on uh, 
WHO, the COVAS facility, the African Union, AVATT. Well, some of them, like South Africa, they are making private arrangements. But the majority of these uh, countries, their political leaders, are relying on charity with regard to COVID-19. They are waiting for what will be donated to them. Uh, Canada now, in the face of all this debate, is now saying, okay, we will donate some. Uh, uh, the UK is also saying, okay, we will at some point donate to uh, uh, you know, poor countries. Mm -hmm. Now, we should not rely on charity. And a country like Nigeria should not be relying on charity. Mm. It's good you brought up the point about uh, what uh, uh, Professor Adeyeye said with regard to the uh, Nigerian effort. But the question is, we need more information. He disclosed that Nigeria is also talking to some other agencies. China, we're talking to China, we're talking to India, uh, we're trying to see whether we can get other vaccine uh, candidates. But we need to see a rollout plan. Mm. Senegal already has a rollout plan. Guinea Conakry has a rollout plan. Algeria, Morocco, they have rollout plans. In some of those countries, they are already administering uh, uh, the vaccine. So when is Nigeria going to tell us about its uh, okay. vaccination centers, its wow. rollout plans, and the expertise that is available, even with regard to the procurement of syringes? Okay. Because uh, we could find ourselves in the Japanese situation okay. where we don't even have enough syringes. I mean, I just want to say this. You've said excellently well, Dr. Abati. This is so bad. It is so bad we don't know the extent. These rich nations hoarding everything as though what they did during colonialism and the struggle for Africa was not enough for them. An American doctor came out to say that I have access, one doctor... I have access to more vaccine than over 130 nations will have. Mm. It is very, very bad. And they must nip this in the board. A Canadian citizen has access to about five vaccines because Canada has more than its population can take. Yeah. So let's be careful. Inequality anywhere is a threat to inequality everywhere. Uh, thank you so much.